Good Choices, a holistic conversation about dance, art and life with Sabine Parza. Hi everybody, this is Sabine Parza with another episode of Good Choices, a holistic conversation about dance, art and life. My guest today is Sharon Booth. I'm very happy to have Sharon here as my guest. I met her about seven years ago when she became a participant at my holistic dance teacher's training. Sharon was born in Montreal and grew up outside of Toronto. She was trained at the National Ballet School at the Banff Center. She has a Bachelor's of Fine Arts from the Juilliard School in New York. She was a professional dancer at the Smuin Ballet Company and the Le Ballet Jazz de Montreal. She is also a certified Pilates instructor. She was a faculty member of the Wiener Staatsoper, a guest teacher at the Musik Musik and Kunst Privatuniversität Wien. She was uh, a teaching member at the Tanz Bozen Festival since 2010, which she is now the artistic director of since 2016. She has opened up her own dance studio in 2020, which is an interesting year to open up a dance studio here in Vienna, which is called Indensity, where she offers dance classes for adults, for children, and for everybody who is interested in dance. I'm very curious to listen also to your response to this episode. We talk about many issues around Uh, being a professional dancer, some of the realities of it, some of the hardships of it, some of the abuse of it, some of it that Sharon was also involved in making visible. And I'm very happy that she shares her story here with us. If you like this episode or if you like any of the other episodes that you've heard, please comment or please share them with somebody else. I think it's important that we talk about our dance form and our professional lives here And maybe if you like them, I think maybe somebody else would also like listening to these podcasts. Hello, everybody. I'm very happy to welcome you back to another episode of Good Choices, a holistic conversation about dance, art and life. I'm very happy to meet today with Sharon, Sharon Booth. Hi. Hi, Sabine. I'm very happy to be here. Oh, Sharon and I, we met I don't even know, was it five, six or seven years ago? Do you remember? It was just over six years ago because I uh, became pregnant with my son when we were doing our training together or when you were training me. That that was right. You were pregnant during that time. So yeah, we first met because you uh, wrote to me, I think, and then you came to a single session first. And I remember um, I was in awe of your dancing right away and in awe of your story also, which is something that I would like to talk about. Um, and then uh, I also remember you, you, were, you were thinking about doing the teacher's training in, uh, at my institute and then you said, oh, but I don't know if I can do it or if, you know, my scheduling and all of that. And you already had uh, your, your girl and your, your family. And then at one point you just called or you wrote and said, I have to do this. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I just have to do this. And I was so touched back then already by sort of your very intuitive um, guidance, internal guidance of how you decided to come to a holistic dance teacher's training as a super professional ballet and modern dancer with a group of people who are not all very professional or coming from very different um, professional backgrounds and how you put yourself into the group and how you just really followed, I would say, your heart at that moment. Do you remember that decision? I that do, you made back yeah. Then? I remember being extremely overwhelmed uh, with our first session of Authentic Movement together. Um, where I was actually wearing a brace because I just had knee surgery and you helped me find my emotions through a movement that was so much more intrinsic and intuitive uh, than my usual way of being big and bold as a dancer. So that both inspired and scared the crap out of me. And (laughs) I think when I moved forward, the next couple of months uh, I was teaching at the Ballet Academy of the the State Opera and 
I thought, oh, there's no way I can juggle having a little girl and working pretty much a full-time job and then taking these weekends to go and further myself in every way. And I said, no, 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 no. And then there was an incident that happened basically in the academy um, with a body shaming situation. And I just thought I need to be able to support myself better to, in order to support these kids. Mm. And that's when I called you and said, I got to do this. I don't know how to deal with the rest of my life, but let's try this way. Yeah, it's beautiful. I remember that moment very clearly. And I was so, yeah, I was just really honored also that you followed your, your um, really your, also your need. I mean, I saw that and I see that a lot. There, I do have again and again professional dancers coming to the holistic dance uh, teachers mm -hmm. training. And oftentimes I see there is a very big need for healing also from the professional training, which, you know, I have had to do myself because I was a professional dancer on stage for such a long time and also training so hard. And uh, I recognized that within your story and I saw that and it was so beautiful to see how you with all your skills were flying and sensing and dancing for yourself. Very often I felt you were really dancing for yourself during that teacher's training. It was such an honor to be your teacher. Oh, Sabine, thank you. It was such an honor to be there and share all of that with so many different people. <laughs> oh, wow. It was great. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, which brings me really to your story, which is that you are from a very early age on, you became really a dancer. I think I remember you telling me that you were in all of these ballet competitions from a very early age on and you became a professional dancer very early on so i'm wondering how your identity as uh, as a young as a girl and then as a young woman how that was formed by being so uh, professionally active early on in your life i would say my identity as a young female wasn't formed um, that my identity was mostly based in the accomplishments and the joy, I have to say, that I that I gained through dance. So um, I didn't come from like a, a dance family at all. Uh, so there was no pressure on me from my parents to go to these competitions or to attend these institutions. It was all my wish. I found my, my, found my voice very early on in dance. And I also loved that I won. I was very competitive very early on. But in terms of my development as a human, it definitely was secondary to my development as a dancer. And then finally, human development came slightly after artistic development. And I don't even think I'm done in, or anywhere close <laughs> to being done for yeah. a good long time. Yeah. Well, I think um, that probably goes for all of us that we can learn as humans yeah. probably for many lifetimes. But I think it is quite specific to training so hard um, as I mean, I think it's it's the same in sports with gymnasts or with any sort of uh, any sort of high end training profession, musicians, gymnasts, dancers, any of these uh, sort of high performative uh, goal oriented training uh, settings for children where it's just about achieving um, that oftentimes, yeah, the time for human interaction, the time for, for uh, your real true needs, maybe also as a child were neglected because your physical training was in the foreground. Would you describe it like that? Or how did you, like, how did you even recognize that you needed something as a human <laughs> being later on? <laughs> like, where did that come from? Um... So first to, to go back a little bit, I think the need for, for elite athletes, we'll call them, and or performers, yeah. uh, there's such a high level of competition in any of those fields that we literally just wear blinders. So there's no time for interaction with non-dancers. There's no time for um, an education outside of the studio. I was lucky. I did go to a normal high school before I went to Juilliard. So I, I did have a little bit more of a, of a general upbringing than a lot of kids that I know who went purely to ballet school. My understanding of how depleted my system was by normal interaction and by normal social connection 
came when um, I realized how sick I was with an eating disorder. So I developed bulimia when I was 13 years old and basically kept in and out of this relationship with food uh, for the for the next 10 years. And only did I basically, when I hit rock bottom, did I realize how unable I was to cope as a human with what the dance world had basically done to me. So that was the beginning, I think, of the end of myself as, a, as purely as a dancer and the beginning of myself as a woman. And did you get support? Did you, who helped you or what helped you in that process? So I quite typically um, denied and lied about my, my disorder the entire decade or all nine years, pretty much. My weight fluctuated extremely. Um, in my fourth year, just before I graduated from Juilliard, I was uh, about 47 kilos, so I'm 173 centimeters and usually around 60 kilos, so I was extremely thin. And the director of the program called me into his office before, like, before I accepted a particular job offer in Sweden. And he told me that he would be happier if I never danced again, because he was so sure that as soon as I left the supportive and... Um, and caring environment of family of Juilliard, he was worried for my life. And I think this just sort of really hit me. It scared me that a man who I had thought um, regarded me as this talent who wanted me to, to go forth and conquer the dance world and represent Juilliard, I was sort of his golden girl, that he would prefer me to not dance than to potentially get more and more diseased. That really stunned me. So from there, I actually declined two very wonderful job offers, told my parents what had happened. And um, a few months later, I was in hospital for, um, for months at a psychiatric sanatorium for an eating disorder. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Whew. <laughs> yeah. It's a very touching story, but it's not the only story within the dance field. I mean, so many dancers have eating disorders. So many professional dancers suffer abuse. So many, um, so much exploitation that happens within the field of professional dance or elite athleticism. I mean, I feel like it's kind of this time now that on many levels, it is starting to become more visible. I mean, there's this documentary about the sexual abuse that happened uh, with the doctor mm -hmm. of the gymnast within the U.S. I mean, it's just something that has become more widely known. Um, I actually, I would like to talk to you more about that because you were also involved in, uh, uh, you were kind of a whistleblower also to some of the abuse that happened here at the Wiener Staatsoper. But before we go there, I would like to ask you, obviously there is this sort of very hardcore, um, the, the hardcore effects of this hardcore training that uh, you went through and many also, many young dancers went through. But what was it back then, if you remember, as a young girl, what, what was it that like made you want to do this so hard or so to such an extreme extent like what was the joy behind it or the pleasure of it and do you still remember that oh i remember it because i still have it every day <laughs> it's i can't do anything else it's the the thought of not dancing um it, it doesn't it's never even really crossed my mind and for for me the the, the biggest joy is to be able to express and connect myself with something else and there always had something um even a spiritual aspect when i was so little i remember being five or six years old and dancing on the lawn in the rain and just feeling like the wind and the trees and everything were part of my being which then i rediscovered more with you because you know in the studio and daily fifth position point shoes and pirouettes and fuetes you kind of lose that but there would still be a freedom. There would still be a freedom in how tuned my body was, my instrument, and then how tuned in it was also with my emotions and connected with music and uh, my athleticism. I felt that there, was, there were no words, there was no vocabulary that better allowed me to communicate than 
out of my body. Well, it's beautiful to hear that you still have that. Because I think the biggest danger of this, and I see that with so many colleagues, and I even noticed that within myself. I mean, I started dancing one training when I was 15 years old, which is much later um, and sort of even almost too late to become a professional dancer. But still, I, I remember when I was dancing after having danced for 15 years also on stage, I just kind of shut down and I needed some total time off. I needed physically, I needed the time off, and I also emotionally needed the time off. But then that fire never went away. So I like five or six years later, after I had my children, uh, it's this famous story of me dancing uh, to Kate Bush's new album in the kitchen. And I was just like, OK, this music, I just I just can't not dance. Yeah, it's just not possible. And it's so good to hear that that fire never went away, that uh, yearning also, that really intrinsic expression that your body just wants to dance no matter what the circumstances Absolutely. are. Absolutely. Beautiful that you still yeah. have that. Yeah. yeah. So um, you've had quite the career. You were, as you said earlier, you were competing as an early child. You did all these uh, competitions, right? Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just performing for an artistic uh, sort of, I mean, that, that combination in of itself, like, there's artistry on the one hand, but then that it then when it's coupled with competition. So you were dancing in these ballet competitions uh, as a child. Could you describe that for people who don't even know what that looks sure. like? Sure. Um, there would be generally like some a version of a convention where a lot of the judges would also be giving classes. So the larger versions of this that often took place in the United States we would go to, and I came from a pretty small town where there wasn't very good dance training at all. So the reason that we went to these competitions was to get exposure to these excellent teachers. And I would take classes with them. And then over the weekend, there would be competitions where every two year increment would have uh, their own age category. And there would be solos, duets, trios, groups, large groups, production numbers. And there would be a panel of judges, usually more than about three. And um, after everyone did their little two minute show all your stuff, hit it and quit it on stage, there would be an adjudication to which they would hand out first, second and third prize and eventually also scholarships. And so what was really important um, for me was that I received a lot of scholarships to go in to train with these judges who were also very excellent or very well-known teachers, not all of them excellent, but all of them very well-known in, in big cities and to get exposure this way. Because even if I was, um, okay, yeah, I was the best in Waterloo, Ontario, where I came from, uh, we didn't really know how to compare me, myself. I, we didn't know how to compare my talent as a dancer until we went into a bigger playing field. Um, and so that was sort of a way for me to perform more regularly and not just at the end of the school year recital. So I would have at least then 10 opportunities to do my solos, multiple solos, um, and use the costumes that my mother made for me and the time that we'd spent on the choreography and everything. So uh, when people now see these reality television shows, Dance Moms or that kind of thing, it wasn't like that at all. I mean, it wasn't like that with for, my, for me and for my, my parents. My mother was very supportive, but she would be doing a crossword puzzle and not changing my, my nail color or making sure my, my turns were perfect. She let me do my thing and she was very proud of me, but it was never a, a force, like got to win kind of thing. I just did happen to win a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. And then you went on, you went on to the famous Juilliard school, um, which, I mean, it's, I think the movie Fame is based on, on Juilliard, is that correct? That Juilliard the movie Fame is based on the high school that's right across the street from Juilliard called, called LaGuardia. So oh, nice. it's the feeder school basically to Juilliard for all the, the New Yorkers. Yeah. 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 And how was that? I mean, it's such a famous school. Um, how was that for you? You were there for four, four or five Four years. years yes. I got my uh, Bachelor of Fine yeah. Arts there. It was a, ba it was just, um, yeah, a dream come true for a dancer. We had the best teachers of the most well-known techniques. We had the opportunity to perform with the Juilliard Orchestra, 
on stage. I lived in Lincoln Center right next to the Metropolitan Opera and the State Theater um, for four years. Our interaction was so international. Um, my first roommate was a Korean violinist. So to say she was a little bit different than me is um, a little bit of an understatement. Uh, so the, the interaction of just massive amounts of talent uh, from all around the world was one of the most special aspects beyond the training. And what I found incredible about my class and the director, Benjamin Harcarvey, who was also the founder of Netherlands Dance Theater, is that he chose talent. He didn't choose a body type or a type of training. Um, so within the 25 people that he chose out of the 1500 that auditioned that year, we were um, between ages of 18 and 23 to start, between um, the size of you, so an itty bitty power ball and an enormously tall Amazonian woman, um, a ballet dancer who had trained in Argentina for many years and performed professionally, and me, the jazz bunny from Waterloo, Ontario. So he didn't try to fit any of us into any kind of cookie cutter because there was no feeder company for Juilliard to go into. So he just wanted to make the best dancers, the most well-rounded dancers to go forward and to try to change the dance world in a grassroots way, instead of trying to pluck professional dancers that all looked the same from what he had seen in his time as a director. Yeah, which I think is so important. I mean, I think you're you're getting right to one very important point, which is going to lead us also to one of the big stories that I would like to talk to you about, the story about the Wiener Staatsoper. But is this that many training programs are either totally void of any sort of professional context. I think that is one of my biggest criticisms of some of the contemporary dance schools or centers within Europe, that they just have professional training, but they're not connected in some in, in any way to the real reality of the professional situation. There's no choreographers coming through or there's no relationship that's being established. Or on the other hand, there is just a training program or a school that, as you said, that are simply training the bodies that are then maybe or maybe not wanted in that particular uh, uh, company or by that particular choreographer. Now, I had a very special situation because I, I went to school at Columbia College in Chicago and Columbia was a college. It was a professional dance training place. People could just take open classes. It was also the home of Mordine and Company Dance mm -hmm. Theater, and it was the presenter for modern dance in Chicago, the main presenter. So we were training as students and as professionals with all the companies that came to visit Chicago. So we were training with the Trisha Brown Company, with the Merce Cunningham Company, with Bill T. Jones, with all of these big ass companies. And we were like, we could physically meet the choreographers, we could meet the the dancers, we could see them warming up, we could see them rehearse. And I think um, that is on, on, on one hand, it's, it's so missing on some of, the, some of the training levels that I see in some of the contemporary dance centers. Mm -hmm. And or on the other hand, it's only sort of mastered towards one particular style of dancing. So it sounds like Juliet was really uh, a beautiful place for you to train as a dancer in mm -hmm. general. And then you probably went on to say, okay, here I am. Let's see what we can do with it. Yes, absolutely. They just really filled up our, yeah. our tool bag or our toolbox with so many different uh, tools, basically. And and those tools coming yeah. from sort of the, the master craftsmen, of, of craftspeople of dance, um, who gave total yeah. context to all of our technique by bringing their dancers and their choreographers to us as students that we got to work with. Yeah. yeah. Could you just shortly mention, like, was it was it ballet? Or no, it was it was completely it was completely mixed. So we had ballet class every day and modern class every day, um, and modern was based on sort of the the classic techniques. So we started with Graham and Lamone, then we would add in Taylor. Um, there was some Horton. There was African that was introduced to us. We had jazz, but I wasn't allowed to take it because I would get too jazz bunny happy. So only my fourth year I was allowed to have jazz. Um, we had <laughs> you would literally bounce off the floor and just sort of land on the ceiling. Yeah, somewhere, I would just right? get way yeah. too happy. <laughs> we had classical and contemporary partnering. Um, we had Alexander technique. 
and then we would have repertoire and we would work with Yuri Killian, Nacho Duato, um, Matt Sek. Um, we staged works from, uh, well, I staged works from Crystal Pipe then later on, but we were sort of, we were sort of always involved with the current and yet the classical um, aspects of both modern and classical ballet. Yeah. Which is who, what made you also, because I see you both as a, as, a, as a dancer who has a very strong background in ballet and, and a contemporary background, um, which I think is lovely to see and not everybody can pull that off. Thank you. As a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Now, somehow after your professional dancing, also you danced, um, can you name those two companies? Because I think you can pronounce sure. them better than I yeah. do. The two, the two mm -hmm. companies that you went on to dance professionally? So I first actually danced with a company called Savage Jazz Dance, which was a jazz um, company based in Oakland. And that was a very, very different experience for me. I was definitely the only white girl. We would be on stage for um, for performances with an 18 piece jazz orchestra on stage with us. And as the nature of jazz is improvisation, we would have no idea when the musician would finish his solo thereby my, my solo would finish. So it was a very, very interesting <laughs> um, way for me to get back into dance after I'd been in the hospital. So from Juilliard, I went into the hospital, mm -hmm. didn't think I would dance again ever, then found myself in this very, very warm and welcoming community in the jazz scene in Oakland. Um, and then from there, put my point shoes back on and danced with Smew and Ballet in San Francisco, and then moved to my childhood dream of a company which was called uh, which is still called Les Ballets Jazz de Montréal in Montreal and Les Ballets Jazz is a repertoire company that toured the world when I was with them about 70% of the year we would be on tour uh, doing works of Crystal Pite, Rodrigo Pedernieres, um, again, Paul Taylor and Nacho Duato and Yuri Killian. A lot of, um, a lot of new choreographers came through and I had I guess it was a short time, but it was very intense. Three and a half years with Les Ballets Jazz. Yeah. A short time, but very intense, I'm sure, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you were uh, basically living in the studio and in the theater and had no private life outside exactly. of that, touring. And yeah, all that. nor did I want one. It was yeah, definitely enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Beautiful to hear also that your childhood dream mm -hmm. came true. It did. In that yeah. sense. And then... And then the uh, injury, I think, uh, came along. Was that part uh, still of the time that you were uh, dancing in the yes, company? Yes, um, in the rehearsal for a work by Azure Barton, I basically broke my hip and um, mm. had a surgery to resurface my femur, the head of my femur, and was told afterwards that it would be highly unlikely that I would ever be able to return to performing um, at that level of professionalism again. So that... Did you prove them wrong? Well, yes, I did. Now, I haven't gone ever back to full-time professional dancing because I can't actually trust yeah. that my other hip wouldn't also break. But um, that I came back to dance, yes, it did happen a little later. Yeah. At what age? So I, I broke my hip when I was 29. I moved to Vienna um, yeah. to escape basically that trauma um, thinking that I would never dance again. The government of Canada gave me the opportunity to be financed to retrain myself. And I entered the Pilates Academy of Vienna to become a Pilates teacher. But I really miss dancing. And so a little bit after my surgery, I went to a studio here in Vienna where I met uh, Simona Noja, who then became the director of the Wiener Staatsoper Ballet Academy. Um, and that's how that began. Um, while I was, before I started with the, the Ballet Academy, I did start performing with Sebastian Prantl and of uh, Tanz Atelier Wien, with um, Bert Gstettner in Tanz Hotel, and uh, with Boris Nebula uh, with a project out of Dance Arts in the Third District. I think it's so interesting, you know, as I do these interviews on these podcasts, um, Again and again, I come across dancers in different stages and with different backgrounds also. I mean, many, there are many of us who are out here who did not have an early dance training um, 
But uh, many have been told in different stages of their life, either you're never going to be a professional dancer or you're never going to dance professionally mm -hmm. again. And I think it's so interesting that um, that level of um, sort of independence that it takes from us as an artist also and as a dancer to say, yeah, maybe that's true. And thank you very much for your uh, medical opinion. Um, but I'm going to listen to my body and I'm going to listen to that part of my soul that really says, no, nah, I have something to say. And uh, there wants, something wants to come through and to really kind of listen more closely to that than to the doctors. Mm -hmm. Do you remember that? Do you remember that moment where you maybe even had the doctor's voice in your head and like had to make an internal decision? Again, I'm back to the intuitive sure. sort of sensibility here. So just a bit of background, because I had been so um, disordered in my eating as a, as a teenager, um, parts of my body didn't develop properly. So it led to early onset osteoarthritis. So the doctors were correct when they said that I would never be able to trust my body to perform at that level as rigorously as I had. Um, subsequently, I've had now four knee operations. <laughs> I just came out of a of, out of a huge brace for another another huge rupture of a ligament, and so I did I did live the consequences of making the decision to go against medical advice <laughs> by like often breaking myself. Um, however, I wouldn't take it back at all because as much as they were correct in their medical in their medical advice, they could never have possibly diagnosed the kind of depression and mental anxiety that I would have if I ever actually stopped dancing. So, I mean, my mother knows when I'm freaked out or depressed or overwhelmed or stressed, she'll just say, go dance. Oh, you just had knee surgery? I don't care. Just go dance because any physical ailment is nothing compared to the heartache and the mental angst that I get without dancing. So yes, when I first stepped into the ballet studio again and I put myself into fifth position, I thought, uh-huh, this is a big choice. Do we really have to do ballet? Could we do something a little bit? But it's just so in, ingrained in me to go back to the bar, to stand in first position and to do the plie. It's just a ritual that I couldn't rid myself of and still yeah. can't. So I made the choice and I'm happy I did. Yeah. 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 <laughs> just kind of have to I think we were just I, I mean I you know I have a different story but still I, I feel very I feel a strong kinship to you in the sense that dance is not a question yeah it's just there it's sort of my guiding it's my guiding light you know everything else just kind of um, yeah comes along and it changes maybe the form changes also how I engage sure. in it. And I see that also in your story mm -hmm. because you now own, I mean, you you uh, you run a dance studio, you opened up uh, in dance, in density mm -hmm. yeah. uh, uh, in 2020, which is a very interesting year to open up a dance studio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're also the artistic director of uh, Tanz Bozen, which is a beautiful international dance festival. And you've been teaching there since 2010 and became the artistic director afterwards. So you are engaged both as a dancer, as a choreographer, as a teacher and as a programming director. So it's very clear your commitment and your passion to dance. It's beautiful and very clear. Thank you, Sabine. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. So there was a big story um, there was a big story that kind of hit the newspapers, both in Austria, hit the news, but also hit internationally. You were teaching at the Wiener Staatsoper for quite some years, and I actually remember it because you were in the teacher's training while you were already teaching there. And uh, I remember some of our conversations that deeply touched me back then. And then a few la years later, the story came out about um, psychological and physical abuse at the school. And as I understand it, and maybe you can just share that a little bit, you were quite instrumental in bringing light into the dark at the situ for that situation there. You, I think you um, made contact with Florian Klenk at the Falta. I don't know if that was you, but uh, Florian uh, was very um, actively engaged. It was a cover story at the Falta 
which doesn't happen very often that uh, the arts or even dance are on the cover story of, of a major independent newspaper. But it also made news all the way to the New York Times. And um, I remember seeing it and I remember hearing about it and I was just so touched by your courage to speak up for the students there. So I, I'm wondering how that was for you, also having gone through some of the abuse yourself and having witnessed that and then being a teacher there, what made you decide to talk about the situation there and how was that for you? So uh, I taught at the at the Stats of, at the Stats Ballet for uh, seven years uh, as a contemporary teacher and as a ballet teacher. And after having gone through what I went through with the eating disorders, I made it a priority that every year I would sit down with every class and tell them my story, and basically say I was 13, I had a body image issue, I became bulimic. And basically, my career ended at 29. And to sort of scare them into realizing like, oh, whatever I do now is going to highly affect what I what happens to me in the future, because I never had a teacher say that to me, maybe I would have changed my way. So that was really big for me. And because I was so open with my story, the students became very open with me about their stories. And it became more and more clear to me that as I had joined the school, there was a, a feeling of change in the air, but it wasn't going rapidly enough, nor was it going in the right direction. So when I started, I, I actually thought we were in Russia in the 1970s, the way that they were being treated, that they were having weigh-ins, the kind of words and uh, vocabulary that the teachers were using in referring to their students and talking to them, sort of pitting them against okay. each other. Go ahead. Yeah. Can you explain way in? Sure. Yeah. Uh, so once a month, the students would line up in front of the nurse's office and would stand on a scale uh, and the nurse would read out the number and then the administrator would note down the weight of the child in front of everybody. So there would be students who would prepare themselves for this way in by um, not eating or drinking anything for a day or two before that. And generally the atmosphere of the school was so involved in high in body shaming and this pressure to be thin that um, students were told by their teachers to eat just pineapple, to uh, drink a glass of water instead of a meal, um, I got involved with the food that they were offering at the internat for students, which was either absolute uh, classic Austrian cuisine, we'll call it, which they felt was really not very um, good fuel for their system or nothing. So it would be there would be nothing in between. And a lot of these students were coming from from countries far, far away. So they didn't have their families to live with. Anyways, I became a bit of a mother figure or an older sister to a lot of them. And mm -hmm. yeah. Also, for the context, how old were these students? Um, were between about? ten, the youngest were the youngest were in first class, so ten and eighteen. Yeah. Yeah. So growing puberty, yeah. major developmental yeah, time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So basically, it got to a point where every time a student would come to me and tell me about either the body shaming that had happened to her from a teacher and or the physical and or psychological abuse that had happened, I would go straight to the director and tell her, be reassured that things were going to change and then realize after a week that nothing had changed and it was happening again. So I started to write down the issues and write them in emails which led to me becoming demoted in my position and blackmailed by the director and basically mobbed to the point by all the other teachers to the point where I was not strong enough to stay on faculty. So I left. Uh, I resigned. I was, I hated myself when I did it, but my ex-husband and his Viennese family were not supportive at that point for me to come forward. They were terrified about what would happen speaking up against the Staatsopera. So I basically just accepted that this is what it was and I resigned. However, a year later, when I heard that um, 
the director who was there at the time was going to be continued when Martin Schlipper, the current director of the, of the company, was taking over, I couldn't sleep because I thought she was going to be leaving in 2020. And to hear that she was going to stay on just meant for me that the nightmare for these kids was going to continue. So that's when I called Florian Clank and began the entire investigation that led to that director being removed from her position and two teachers being criminally investigated and now not having any permission to teach dance at all in Austria anymore. Which was a longer process. Oh, I, mean, yeah. I think there was an investigation and then there was a, like an official investigation. I mean, it was really a big deal yeah. and it's a big deal to, I mean, you're basically, you, you basically show them that on a systematic level, they have sort of have this written uh, commitment to the health of the students. But what was actually really going on was kind of age going back into the the old ages yeah. of, of pre uh, like Russian training. But even I mean, it, it felt like when I read that and I, I wasn't there, I couldn't see it. But when I felt that I was like, OK, is this the 50s or where are exactly. we here? Because internationally speaking, so much has changed. Um, in dance training in general, but I, as I gather also in, in general, ballet training has become more aware. I mean, it's still kind of stuck there, but still, I mean, people are becoming more aware of uh, nutrition, of the abuse that has been going on with these elite athletes, which they were. And I, as from also what I hear from you, you were sharing that, you were sharing that publicly, that ballet training does not have to be that way there is another way to train a young body that they can be healthy that they have curves that they can still be extremely beautiful and professional and aesthetically pleasing um, athletes yeah but without the the level of abuse Absolutely. and just hearing all of that it was just so brutal to hear how how old-fashioned mm -hmm. that was what was going on yeah there. I think I mean I called it the ballet gulag and I think one of the scariest things was to realize that all the teachers who were the most abusive teachers had been badly abused themselves and so this cycle of abuse that happens domestically and obviously institutionally as well was happening at the Staatsopera where they simply couldn't learn how to do anything differently because they hadn't had the experience of being trained differently which I find so so sad Uh, so we needed to break the cycle. As the ballet academy wasn't making money for the Staatsopera, there wasn't really that much interest in changing things. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. If no one was telling them that it was broke, just some young crazy dancer was saying, this isn't okay, this isn't okay. As long as there was no proof, one or two dancers kept going into the company every year that was considered successful enough then no one, you know, when no one was going to pay attention. And now they're paying attention. Now there was no nutritionist back then. There was no massage therapy. There was no physical therapy. There was no psychological counseling. None of it. Everyone had to pay to go outside for all of those things. And now all of those things have been implemented. There's a whole wellness center. There's a, like a, a huge... Uh, doctrine of wellness and how to, to train properly. The teachers have to go themselves to proper training just to re-educate whatever was done to as them. It, as it Absolutely. should be. As yeah. it should be. Yeah. It's like, okay, we're finally sort of at a place where, yeah, where we're recognizing what health is about, what young women, like, like one, what young bodies are about, yeah, and what they actually need on this level of professionalism. I'm wondering still because it could have very easily been that you would have gone to a newspaper and they would have said, oh, it's such an elitist thing. Nobody is interested in that kind of story. What happened between you and Florian also? Why did, did why was the Falter really like, why do you think they really listened and why did they, why did they take on the story in the, to the degree that they did? Because they could have maybe written a little paragraph in one of the back pages. But why was it so important to them also to really investigate that? What do you think? I think two aspects. First, Florian really cares and really cares about children. Mm. And so when he saw an image of a Japanese mm. girl who was 37 kilos and sent home to Japan to be shamed for her family, 
and wasn't allowed back until she had gained enough weight without any help from the Staatsopera, just basically kicked out. When he saw pictures of her, he just was furious. How can this be that we are hosting this child, that she develops this illness through our system and we have nothing to support her and send her back to her not wealthy family in Japan where the shame on the family must have been massive. So that was one of the points. Um, when he realized also that I had been so unfairly treated with being fired basically for trying to stand up and do the right thing, that also just raised his hackles to a massive degree. So that this, the, the institution of the Staatsoper is what, it's the biggest in, in Austria, is it not? It's the biggest in industry or it's the biggest institution. Sure. It's the holy, holy grail here. And to talk yeah. up against it um, is really frowned upon. And this was just mm -hmm. very clear that there was a need for this, that, the, that the, the backwards Eastern European archaic way of treating not just dancers, but young, young children from different countries was just going to be institutionalized all the way through until they were dancers. And then the cycle would continue when they were teachers. So if it wasn't going to stop now, we're going to look at another generation of the same kind of belittled, battered ballerinas. Can't speak up for themselves because no one spoke up for them. He was wonderful. Oh, that took a lot yeah. of, yeah, yeah. But it took a lot of courage on your end. It took a lot of courage because I could, I can imagine that it hit so close to your own story, even though you had different training situations. Still, having had gone through some of the uh, the eating disorders, having had gone through that harsh training, it must have hit very close to you and then I would imagine it wasn't necessarily always easy just to also stand in the public eye and say this is I think one of the biggest one of one of the most difficult things about abuse is is that often the person who is pointing towards the abuse is being either shamed or disregarded or criticized or even black mm -hmm. you know like you know we have this whole canceling culture and and I mean there's so much on social media already around that But it's often it's sort of this double whammy of hey I'm I'm actually putting myself out there I'm actually doing something to make it right and then you also probably got a lot of shit for doing that I mean how did how did that feel how did that like and how did you handle that a lot of wine <laughs> <laughs> a lot of wine <laughs> um, honestly I would I I would look at my kids. When they were sleeping at night and I would say, I hope if this ever happens to you that there's someone to do this for you. Mm. Um, I got a lot of a lot of feedback from uh, around the world to support me in this. As a mother, I, I couldn't let it go on. Not even as a dancer, as a mother, I just couldn't accept that mm. other mothers were other teachers were mothers as well, that they were just turning a blind eye to this. So yes, it was hard. It was really hard. Um, I had some eating disorder um, come back, I have to say. And I, um, and I had panic attacks and there was a lot of not good going on. So that was really, really scary. And I lost some friendships for sure. But for the most part, I mean, what are you going to say? Is someone going to say, oh, you're going, you're going up against a big institution for children? I mean, of course it's a good thing. Yeah, so we changed uh, location here just to... Um... Let our, <laughs> let our viewers know. Um, and we're kind of wrapping up here. I think uh, it's just really beautiful to hear your story. Um, there is something new going on that you started, which is uh, your studio. Do you want to share what's going sure. on there? How are you handling that during the, during the pandemic also? How is, what is it that you're offering there? So Sharona in the time of Corona took over... Um, a beautiful 250 square meter studio in the 8th district and by happenstance it's right across the street from my apartment which is wonderful because as a single mother it would be very very difficult to be working and looking after my children in the way that I want to raise them to be good little beings. 
Um, we have a very inclusive atmosphere at Indancity, and we have from ballet to bachata, hip hop to yoga, a lot of Pilates, a lot of kids courses and a lot of open courses for adults in every level as well. So it's a very, a very warm atmosphere. It was previously the Shambhala um, studios. And so it has this very holistic, open, very welcoming feeling about it. So I have a team of 11 teachers and um, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled and terrified on a daily basis of the, of the opportunity <laughs> and the responsibility, like, ah, <laughs> but it's going to be all fine. Yeah. So, well, it sounds great. Yeah. That is also quite, you know, it's so close mm -hmm. and that it has a, a warm feeling to yes. it. So um, you can really grow into it. Hopefully it can grow now. I, my feeling is, is it's going to get easier. I think so too. Um, already. Yeah. You can, Yeah. yeah. And do you want to share about uh, Tans Botsen? Sure. What's going on there? Yeah. So uh, Tans yeah. Botsen is again the last two weeks of July. Uh, we are aiming to have as full a program as ever. And our range of, of, of um, opportunities is also for little, little ones to uh, through golden age or joy of dance. So we have people who are 90 years old who are dancing with our, our wonderful teachers who are from all over the world. We have a lot of live music, which is really important in Tanzboltzen and mm. generally the environment and atmosphere in Tanzboltzen is also incredibly inclusive and very, very welcoming for all people and from all walks of life. So I'm extremely happy to be there. And you have these Yeah. yeah, and you have these beautiful big studios. We do. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well. We're so, very, very lucky. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that festival has been going on for many years. We're right? almost at forty um, years now. This... Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. Must be one of the oldest dance festivals in Europe. Yeah, and it's. I mean, it's. We have about 800 participants in the two weeks, um, but we have lots of space mm -hmm. and so many studios that everyone has a lot of room to dance and to play. So. Yeah, yeah. So maybe to finish up, what would you say to anybody, if it's a young girl who wants to become a professional dancer or the 40-year-old software programmer who just loves to dance and is thinking about doing uh, a teacher's training, or what do you say to people when they tell you, I want to dance? What would, you, what would you tell them? If you can do anything else, do. If you can't, close your eyes, take a few really, really deep breaths, and just start to move. Just listen to your world and start to move. Oh, it's so good to you see you, too, Sharon. Sabine. Great to hear your thank story. You. Thank you for sharing, and thank you for your heartfulness and your commitment to the form. Thank you. Thank you for helping me so much with my commitment. <laughs> my pleasure <laughs> I wish you all the best with all your with all your journeys um, with your projects and may there more be adventures to come I can't imagine that that is going to be the end. <laughs> no. I'm pretty sure there's going to be many more many more interesting projects coming out of your beautiful talent so, thank you thank you thank you Sabine bye, bye. ciao, ciao. If you would like to know more about Holistic Dance and the Holistic Dance Institute, please visit us at our website www.holistic-dance.at. Holistic Dance is an invitation to transformation through dance, movement and touch. It was founded by me, Sabine Parzer, in 2010. It is a mix of different methods, a dynamic cross-method approach from dance pedagogical, dance and body therapeutic, systemic and holistic methods. We offer authentic movement, integrative contact improvisation, somatics and applied anatomy, improvisation, ecosomatics and many more elements. I offer holistic dance workshops, I offer single sessions, I offer teachers trainings, embodiment trainings, advanced teachers tracks, year groups and retreats. I would be very happy to see you at one of our events. And if you have any questions, please write me an email.